Hello everyone and welcome to the TFR CAN Colloquium. Uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Professor Loredana Lanzani, uh, who will be telling us about the Hoshi Zege projection and its uh, commutator for domains in CN with minimal smoothness. Uh, so over to you. Uh, Thank you, Nishant, for the invitation and for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as I was telling Nishant, I have optimized my screen here, which means I can't see any of you. So your questions are welcome at any point during the talk, but I need to hear a verbal prompt so that I can know someone has a question because I can't see it on the screen. So without further ado, let's see now. Oops, for some reason, I'm not able to change page anymore. Uh, How come? So when we did our test, it was yes, possible. Yes. Wait, let me pause. Right. So in this talk, uh, what I would like to do is I would like to give uh, a little bit of a survey of my earlier joint work with Eli Stein, which motivated the more recent work uh, with joint with uh, Zhuan Duong from Macquarie University and Ji Li from Macquarie University and Brett Wick from Washington University in St. Louis. So I'll start with a survey of this earlier result with Stein and then I'll move on to the more recent work. And since I understand from Nishant that there are a few graduate students in the audience, I thought it might be a good idea to provide a little bit of historical context. And so um, everything goes back, back to about many, many years ago. I, I, I can't do the math, but certainly over 40 years ago in the latest in the late 1970s to work of Norberto Kurtzman and Eli Stein. They made a very simple observation. The fact that there is a factorization that occurs in the general context of operator theory, it applies to a very broad context. And I will tell you about it later, which turns out to be employable in the specific context of the solution of the LP regularity problem for the Cauchy Zego projection. These are all notions that I will define more rigorously uh, later on. Right now, I just want to give you an idea of the general context that we are operating in. So there is a basic factorization from operator theory, very elementary, and it turns out to be employed in the specific context of this one particular problem, the LP regularity problem, pertaining to this particular operator, the cauchy zego projection, which is associated to a bounded domain in complex Euclidean space in any dimension. And the domain at the time had to satisfy rather restrictive requirements, which, however, which I'll tell you about later. And the point is that at the time, in the late 70s, these requirements were optimal. Interestingly, at about the same time, almost the same year, the Kurtzman Stein first paper appeared, uh, singular integral operators were growing into a topic of central interest in harmonic analysis. And this was due to the, to the work of Calderon and Zygmunt, who were at the time laying the ground for what became known as the Calderon-Zygmunt theory. And this approach allowed to dramatically relax the requirements on the ambient domain compared to the work that Kurtzman and Stein were doing at the time. However, one has to note that in general, if the domain is not sufficiently regular, again, I'll be more specific later, it turns out that the cauchy zigo projection, the operator of interest to Kurtzman and Stein, in fact, is not calderon zygmunt And so the calderon zygmunt theory, which was being developed by uh, Calderon and Zygmunt for this non-smooth, non-regular domains, in fact, would not be applicable to this particular singular integral operator, the cauchy zigo projection. This is to give you a little bit of context. About 40 years after this earlier work of Kurtzman and Stein, Stein and I revisited this problem and we found a way of reinterpreting this original basic factorizations that was highlighted uh, by Kurtzman and Stein themselves. 
to reinterpret it within a broader context, which ultimately would lead us to the solution of the problem that Kurtzman and Stein postulated back then. However, under substantially less stringent assumptions, which turn out to be closer to the general settings that are afforded by the calderon zygmunt theory. And now if we fast forward a few more years, 2021, jointly with uh, Duong, Li, and Wick, and independently Wagner and Wick, we all realize that this new broader context, um, in fact, highlights a rather general factorization paradigm. This is the words that I will use to refer to it. And this paradigm may in fact take many forms depending on the regularity of the ambient domain and also on the nature of the problem at hand. And so in this many forms, it can be employed to study other problems, um, in particular, the LP regularity problem for the same operator as before, However, in the context of weights, so the weighted theory for the LP regularity problem of the cauchy zego projection under the most general possible family of weights, which are known as the Mackenhout AP weights. This is something Stein and I had not been able to solve. And in fact, even changing the problem from the study of the projection itself to the study of its commutator, which is an operator very different in nature, from the projection itself. And it turns out that even though these two operators are very different in nature, there are certain aspects of this general phenomenon which are applicable to this commutator operator. So what I would like to do today is try to highlight the factorization paradigm, hoping that you, the people in the audience, may be aware of other, for instance, more geometric contexts that are of interest to you where these ideas may be applicable. So let's start with the very basic principle I was mentioning earlier on discovered by Kurtzman and Stein, which I think was in fact known in the operator theory community already in an abstract setting. But Kurtzman and Stein were able to actually employ it and obtain applications in a concrete setting. And so one starts with the Hilbert space H and a closed subspace of H. And so correspondingly, we know from basic functional analysis, theory of Hilbert spaces, that there's going to be a unique orthogonal projection mapping the Hilbert space onto its closed subspace. Now, orthogonality can be equivalently formulated as the projection being self-adjoint with respect to the inner product in the given Hilbert space. And equivalently, uh, the projection, the operator S being of minimal norm and being a projection, this means the norm has to be one. So you have this orthogonal projection to begin with, which is granted by Hilbert space theory. Now, suppose that besides the orthogonal projection, you have another projection, which takes the, the Hilbert space onto the same closed subspace. And at this stage, we can formulate the problem at such a general level, which may, we may allow this non-orthogonal projection to be only densely defined. So the basic idea from operator theory is to simply compare these two operators as projections defined on the same Hilbert space and mapping onto the same closed subspace. And so if you look at this first equation, this means that if you start with, say, the non-orthogonal projection, it's going to take the Hilbert space to the closed subspace. And then if you, if you follow that with your orthogonal projection, being a projection, it's going to be the identity on the closed subspace, which leads to this operator equation, which may hold either on just the dense uh, subspace of H or on the, on the whole of H, depending on what you know about the non-orthogonal projection. Now, if you switch the role of these two uh, projections, if you switch the orthogonal with the non-orthogonal one, by the same principle, you get this second equation on H. So now you take this second equation and you take adjoints or formal adjoints of both sides if, if the non-orthogonal projection is only densely defined. 
And then you remember that one of these two projections is self adjoint. And so taking the adjoint of this equation leads to this third equation. And so now you take the first and the third and you subtract the first equation from the third, which leads you to this identity. And now you simply solve for the non-orthogonal projection. Solving for the non-orthogonal projection, take this to the other side and this to the right hand side, you obtain this new equation where I is the identity operator on the Hilbert space. So you see that you are expressing the non-orthogonal projection in terms of the orthogonal projection, the identity, and this operator, which is the difference between the formal adjoint and uh, of the non-orthogonal projection in itself. I'll refer to this as the primordial identity. And this identity may hold either on the full Hilbert space, if so, if the non-orthogonal projection is fully defined, or just the dense subspace. So now we start to layer, to add hypotheses. So now we suppose that our non-orthogonal projection is or extends to a bounded operator on the Hilbert space itself. And then we remind ourselves of the spectral theorem, which in, for self-adjoint operators, which in particular says the following. If you have a bounded self-adjoint linear operator defined on a Hilbert space, then the spectrum of the operator is not only going to be purely real, but it's going to be, in fact, contained in this compact subset of the real line, where this number here is the operator norm of our bounded operator. So now, in particular, this means that if you pick any non-real number alpha, then the difference of your original operator minus alpha times the identity is going to be invertible with a bounded inverse. So let's apply this fact to the following choice of self-adjoint linear operator, namely the imaginary unit times the difference between the, uh, the adjoint of the non-orthogonal projection and the non-orthogonal projection itself. So this is the operator T of choice. And then for the non-real number alpha, we pick the imaginary unit. So applying this lemma from the spectral theory to this choice of T and alpha tells us immediately that the identity minus the difference between the, for the adjoint and the, the adjoint and the non-orthogonal projection is invertible on the Hilbert space and has a bounded inverse. And so we may go back to the primordial identity and now compose both sides with the inverse of this operator, obtaining this new equation, which now expresses the non-orthogonal, the orthogonal projection solely in terms of the non-orthogonal one. The identity holds on the full Hilbert space, given the assumptions we are now making, and I'll refer to it as the basic factorization. So now we keep making further assumptions. So I started by assuming that my non-orthogonal projection was bounded on the Hilbert space. And now I'm assuming more. I'm assuming that in fact, this non-orthogonal projection and its adjoint are meaningful and bounded on a far larger class of normed spaces that contains our Hilbert space as just one instance. Meaningful meaning that they are well defined on a dense subspace of XP for any P in the parameter set and extend to a bounded operator. So we make this further assumption and now we make the assumption that the orthogonal projection that we started with is also well defined on a dense subspace of each of these normed spaces. And we further assume, furthermore assume, that the difference between the non-orthogonal and the orthogonal projection has some cancellation that is true on each member of this family of normed spaces. spaces. So under this assumption, what is the objective? 
the objective is to extend this basic factorization from the Hilbert space, which is just one member of this family, to any member of this family. In other words, to prove that this identity, which we know holds on the Hilbert space, in fact holds on each member of this family of norm spaces. I'll refer to it as the XP factorization. So now, once you have this factorization on this space, by looking at the right hand side, based on what we know, the further assumptions we have made, um, one knows that the right hand side extends to a bounded operator on each member of this family of norm spaces. And so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that this orthogonal projection, which was defined and bounded originally on just one member in this family, the Hilbert space, in fact, extends to a bounded operator for each member of the family of norm spaces. This means that we have solved the XP regularity problem for the orthogonal for the given orthogonal projection. So now let's look at a concrete setting where this um, argument from Hilbert and norm space theory uh, may be applied. And that is the problem of LP regularity for the cauchy zego projection. Specifically, we start with a bounded domain in Euclidean complex space. Here, for convenience, I'm taking complex dimension at least two, but what I'm about to say is in fact valid even in the plane where in fact we have even stronger results. So we have a bounded domain in Euclidean space and we're simply assuming that the boundary of this domain is rectifiable. So now for this XP family, we're just taking the Lebesgue spaces, P between one and infinity. And so in particular, the Hilbert space of interest is L2. Everything is being taken with respect to induced Lebesgue measure for the boundary of this domain, which is perfectly meaningful and well-defined if the domain is rectifiable. And now, what do we take for the closed subspace of our Hilbert space L2? We take the um, the, the, the so-called holomorphic Hardy space, which can be defined in a variety of ways. Here I'll take the, the approach that's going to be convenient for the applications we have in mind later on. And so it's defined as follows. You first start with functions that are holomorphic, analytic, in the interior of the domain, and furthermore satisfies the assumption that they are non-tangential maximal function in other words, for any point zeta on the boundary, you have you take um, a non-tangential approach region, let's call it a cone, say, um, which, which is pointed at the point in the boundary. This, this non-tangential approach region will be contained in the domain if you have if you're making the right assumptions. And uh, you're taking the supremum of the absolute values of f of z, where z belongs to this non-tangential approach region. So by definition, that's the non-tangential maximal function of f evaluated at the boundary point zeta. So you're making the assumption, the further hypothesis, that your holomorphic function d, f, has the property that its non-tangential maximal function is square integrable. It can be shown that this is a closed, okay, it can be shown that members of this space do possess non-tangential limit. So from this supremum being finite, it follows, and in L2, it follows that the limit as z tends to zeta, when z is in this cone, exists. It's an application of the, the bag dominated convergence theorem. And so the space of non-tangential limits of members of this space is called the holomorphic Hardy space. It can be shown that these non-tangential limits form a closed subspace of our Hilbert space L2. And so by Hilbert space theory, we know that there is a unique orthogonal projection from L2 of the boundary to this Hardy non-tangential limits of the Hardy space. And this is known in the literature as the Zego projection or Cauchy Zego projection of the domain. Okay, so this is the orthogonal projection of interest.
So you remember in this argument that I was highlighting before, you had two operators, the orthogonal projection and some non-orthogonal projection. So what to pick for the non-orthogonal projection? So let's go back for a moment to dimension one. I told you that all of these arguments make sense. In fact, they started in dimension one. So in dimension one, the, the non-orthogonal projection is precisely the Cauchy integral, or rather the, you know, the boundary values of the Cauchy integral. And so one starts with the projection that's given by the Cauchy kernel defined in this way. Zeta is a point on the boundary of the domain and Z is in the interior. You see that I'm thinking of the Cauchy kernel, which is you know, the kernel we study in first, you know, in first complex analysis class, not just as a function, but rather as a differential form, a one zero form to be precise. So the question is when you go to higher them, and we know that this, uh, you know, the Cauchy theorem and Cauchy formula tell us that the Cauchy integral in one dimension does behave as a projection onto the Hardy, the one dimensional Hardy space. So the question is, how do we generalize to higher dimension the Cauchy integral that we know from one variable complex analysis? And the question really is, how to make sense of the expression one over zeta minus zeta when zeta and zeta are not just complex numbers, but rather n, you know, component vectors in CN. And to figure that out, you still go back to dimension one and you realize this little miracle that happens in dimension one. You can take the function one over zeta minus z and simply by multiplying and dividing by the complex conjugate of the denominator, rewrite it in this way. What is the advantage of this way of thinking about it? Well, whereas this expression a priori makes no sense in higher dimension, what's the reciprocal of a vector? This expression makes sense or can be made sense of in any dimension. And this way of thinking about the scalar part of the Cauchy kernel leads to the so-called Martinelli-Bachner kernel in CN. I'm not going to write down the explicit form of the Martinelli-Bachner kernel because we're not going to need it. But what I'm going to say is that it is a problematic kernel because its coefficients will contain objects like this, where j here goes from 1 to n. So why is this now problematic in dimension two or higher, whereas this one is not? In dimension one, this seemingly non-holomorphic function, well, it has complex conjugates on the numerator and absolute values in the denominator. In fact, there is this magical one-dimensional phenomenon which allow to simplify the problematic parts in the numerator and denominator to come up with this expression, which is clearly holomorphic everywhere except the point z or the point zeta, depending on what you're thinking of as your actual variable and your parameter. You see, when you take this in higher dimension, you obtain an object of this kind, but now up here you only have a single component of the vector zeta minus z, so this does not simplify the way it did in one variable. And so the coefficients of the Martinelli-Bachner kernel are no longer holomorphic as functions of the output variable z. And the upshot of this is that the Martinelli-Bachner integral, which you would like to think of the higher dimensional analog of the Cauchy integral, no longer takes square integrable functions into members of the holomorphic Hardy space. And so you cannot use the Martinelli-Bachner integral or its kernel to produce a projection, non-orthogonal projection, to compare against the orthogonal projection. And so you really have to look for a non-orthogonal projection that takes L2 into the holomorphic RT space. And it turns out that the existence of such projection puts constraints of a geometric and regularity nature on the ambient domain. The upshot of which is that the domain has to be a so-called domain of holomorphy. Every domain in one complex variable in dimension one is a domain of holomorphy. That's no longer true in two dimensions or higher.
In fact, it was one of the first phenomena that was discovered in the early 1900s that made people realize that several complex variables is, an in, in, is going to be an interesting subject in its own right and not just a, a trivial extension of one complex variable from dimension one to higher. And once you have a domain of holomorphy, so once D is a domain of holomorphy, then this um, explicit non-orthogonal projection is going to be domain specific. You see that the one dimensional Cauchy kernel and the Martinelli Buckner, which I'm not showing you, in a way is rather universal because the only, the only effect of the particular domain that you're working with, you see zeta minus Z, one over it is meaningful whenever in the entire complex plane, so long as Z and Z are different from one another. So the, the effect of the particular domain that you're working with is only hidden here, because once you restrict your zeta to the boundary of D, what you're doing with this uh, one form is just you're taking its pullback. And that's the only effect of the domain on this, on this differential form. On the other hand, in higher dimension, the effect of the domain on this um, kernel, which I'm not telling you about just yet, is going to be much more, much stronger. So let's now look, now that we understand what are the challenges in going from dimension one to higher dimension in order to find a non-orthogonal projection. Now let's look at the classical setting that Kurtzman and Stein studied in the late 1970s. So our bounded domain in CN has to have this geometric property which grants the fact that it's going to be the domain of holomorphy, namely it has to be strongly pseudoconvex, whatever that means. We're not going to um, give the specific definition. We also need to make an assumption on the amount of boundary regularity that this domain can afford. It has to be of class at least C3. So it has to be defined in terms of a function which has three continuous derivatives or more. In fact, in the original work, Kurtzman and Stein were assuming the domain to be of class C infinity, but then if you read through the proofs, you realize that C3 is enough. So under these assumptions, right around the same time, a few years earlier, Hanking and Ramirez independently constructed a Cauchy type kernel who's, um, which is holomorphic in the output variable Z. And this was a special instance of an algebraic construction which goes under the name of Cauchy Fantapier um, transforms. And so the bottom line is that for this class of domains already in 1974, people knew, were aware of the existence of, of a non orthogonal projection operator of L2 onto the holomorphic RD space. And so if you remember in our general argument that we highlighted before, we needed also to know that this non-orthogonal projection is bounded on LP. How to do that? So the way Kersman and Stein did it was to first work on a so-called model domain. So this is a domain that lies below you see the graph of a certain real valued function rho naught, rho naught so-called defining function, given explicitly by this formula. Z prime here is shorthand for the first n minus one variables. This is a very famous domain, it's known as the Seagull upper half space. It has been studied a lot um, because you see that the defining function for it is rather simple in nature. And it turns out that this uh, Cauchy type non-orthogonal projection for this particular domain, the model domain, can be written explicitly in this way. This is the analog, the higher dimensional analog of the one dimensional Cauchy integral. This is the simplest form of, uh, of Cauchy Fantapier holomorphic kernel that people can uh, have been able to find in this context. And it's the only one that I'm giving you explicitly. And so remember that rho naught has this very explicit form. So Kurtzman and Stein were able to prove directly that the operator defined in this way 
as a principal value integral because one is really interested in this operator as an operator that acts on the boundary. See here, I'm taking z in the interior of the domain, but I'm thinking of this, I wanna think of this as an operator that acts on the boundary of the domain. So I have to allow z to be equal to zeta the integral becomes singular at that point, and so it has to be interpreted, for instance, as a principal value. So by direct inspection, Kurtzman and Stein were able to check that this operator extends to a bounded operator on LP for P between one and infinity. Okay, so all of this is for one particular choice of strongly pseudo-convex domain of class C3. In fact, this is of class infinity. Now, the point is that if you go back to your general setting, your general D, if you know that D is strongly pseudo-convex, whatever that means, then you can show that these Siegel upper half space is a good model for it, in the sense that at every point in the boundary, the original domain D is osculated at that point by a certain translated copy of the Siegel upper half space. This is at the domain level. level. At the operator level, it turns out that if the domain is of class C3 or better, these Cauchy type integral for the model domain, in fact, approximates the operator acting on the original domain D with controlled error. What do we mean by that? Well, everything has to be written down in terms of um, a parametrization of the boundary. So using a parametrization of the boundary, you can rewrite this operator and this operator, whatever it is, as operators acting on R2n minus 1. And at that level, you can compare the two operators. And if you make the difference of the two, you obtain something which um, is small. The error is small. Now, moreover, if the domain is of class C3, it turns out that this difference has some cancellation, in fact, the strongest cancellation one can hope for. Namely, this operator is not just bounded. We know that this is bounded by this osculation argument, and therefore its L2 adjoint so is. It's better than bounded. It's compact on LP for MEP. And this allows you to use Fredholm operator theory and conclude that the identity minus this difference is invertible with a bounded inverse on LP for any, not just on L2, but rather on LP for any P. And so you recover an LP factorization for any P between one and infinity, the first known instance in this context, and it became, it, it came to be known as the Kurtzman-Stein equation. So what happens if you go below the class C3? So here we need to be a little more knowledgeable on the theory of you know, st strongly pseudo-convex domains, but I'll just tell you this. Based on how these domains are defined, they have to have a certain amount of regularity built in. The minimal amount of regularity is not class C3, but rather class C2. So we're just going down one unit from the assumption in the classical context to the setting of current interest, interest, class C2. So at this point, if your domain is of class C2, the notion of strong pseudo-convexity still makes perfectly sense. And you can still define a holomorphic type Cauchy integral as in the classical case. However, if you try to follow the, the Kurtzman and Stein argument, to study the Zigo, cauchy zego projection for these domains, the steps in, the, in their proof, which I highlighted before, fail in two fundamental ways. First of all, if the domain is only a class C2, it is no longer true that um, the Cauchy type integral for the model domain is a good approximation of the actual Cauchy type integral you want to study. That's the first obstacle. The second obstacle is that this difference is no longer compact, not even in L2. There are not enough cancellations to go from boundedness to compactness. So how do you get 
you know, how do you get around these two problems? One here introduces a new thing. Remember I said that this Cauchy Zego projection is an orthogonal projection, which is equivalently meaning that it is self-adjoint. Now, the notion of a joint for a, for a given operator is dependent upon the choice of measure that you, you, that you make uh, for your Hilbert space. You know, it's dependent upon, upon the choice of uh, inner product. And for the family LP, for the family L2, the choice of inner product depends on the choice of measure that you're putting on the boundary. And so for any given measure, you have a corresponding orthogonal projection. So in order to get around this issue of uh, class C2 in the context that we are interested in and the lack of compactness for the difference we were talking about, we consider not just a single measure as before, namely the la, la induced Lebesgue -like measure, we consider a family, omega j. And so correspondingly now we have, corresponding to this family of measures, we have a family of orthogonal projections. Now there's a caveat. Even in the best case scenario, that is to say when the two measures in your family, I haven't told you yet what family I'm working with, are equivalent to one another. So then even in that case, you do have, because of this equi equivalence, you have a set theoretical identity here. Any function which is square integrable with respect to the first measure will be also square integrable with respect to the second. However, these two sets which are identical, meaning they have the same elements, they become different as Hilbert spaces because you're putting in two different notions of inner product. And so as a result, the corresponding orthogonal projections are going to be different from one another and there is no direct relation that, put, that allows you to express one in terms of the other. So because of this observation, this suggests that in our current setting below the class C2, C3, the particular choice of measure that you decide to put on the boundary may play a significant new role in the analysis of the problem that we're interested in. And so this brings us to my work with Eli from 2017. We're now working in the setting of minimal regularity afforded by strong pseudoconvexity. So we changed the, re the reference measure from induced Lebesgue measure to what we came to call Lurie-Levy. So you see, I am choosing a defining function for my domain D, and I'm using that particular defining function to define an object, uh, which turns out to be a measure for the boundary of D, which I refer to the Lerelevy measure. Now, it turns out that this measure depends on the choice of defining function and every domain, if, if a domain has one defining function, then it's going to have infinitely many. So in real, in reality, you have a whole family of Leray Lavi measures. Moreover, we extend this family to the Leray Lavi like measures. And so these are going to be given by multiples of the Leray Lavi measures where the factor is a function, given function that's continuous up to the boundary of the domain and bounded below by some positive constant. It turns out that the induced, the original measure, induced Lebesgue, is Lerelevy like if we assume that the domain is strongly pseudoconvex in a class C2. Okay, so now we have a whole family of reference measures. We also need a family of Cauchy Fantapic holomorphic Cauchy integrals. This family is parameterized by this parameter epsilon. And it turns out, so they are obtained by essentially approximating our defining function with uh, um, a family of smooth functions. So we are, we are approximating the second derivatives of rho uh, uniformly on compact subsets by, by um, smooth functions and replacing the second derivatives of rho with this approximating functions. 
And so it turns out that by changing your technology from this osculating by model domain uh, technique of Kurtzman and Stein in the, second, in the 70s to a technique from uh, the calderon zygmunt theory, the modern calderon zygmunt theory, which is known as T of 1 theorem, I will not go into the details of that, one can in fact show that this Cauchy, holomorphic Cauchy integrals are bounded in LP for P between 1 and infinity. And so you see that now we recover a family of basic factorizations. You have in L2, in the Hilbert space, you have one such factorization for any epsilon, for any member in the Cauchy holomorphic Cauchy integral family. However, the second main abstraction, namely cancellation of singularities between uh, the, in the difference of this holomorphic Cauchy integrals and their adjoints persists. There is not enough cancellation to ensure that this difference is compact. And so what do we have to do? We have to take uh, a microscope and look at our holomorphic Cauchy kernels under this microscope. What does that mean? It means that you have to take uh, um, a smooth um, cutoff function which is whose, whose support is concentrated near a fixed point, arbitrarily fixed point in the boundary. You do that for every zeta on the boundary. And so you multiply your Cauchy Fantapia kernel times the smooth cutoff function. And to keep it the same, you also have to subtract the multiplication by the smooth cutoff function. This breaks up the kernel and the corresponding operator into the sum of two pieces. The one, the first one, the essential part, has mass concentrated near the point zeta that you're looking into to study your singularities, and the other one, which is the remainder. So now you have the sum of two objects, the essential part and the remainder. So it turns out that the essential part is again bounded in LP for any epsilon and for any P, again by an application of the so-called TO1 theorem. Well, we knew that this is bounded in LP. We have proved that this is bounded in LP. So of course the remainders are bounded in LP. But we need something more. We need to show that their remain the remainders and their L2 adjoints are what we say, what we call the term weakly smoothing, which means that they take functions which are merely integrable L1 into bounded functions, essentially bounded functions. They take L1 to an infinity. So you go back to the primordial identity, the one where you do not yet invert the identity minus your uh, difference of Cauchy type integrals. You take your Cauchy type integrals and its adjoint in this identity and you break them up in this way. And then you group this breakup in terms of, you know, the difference of the essential parts plus the difference of the remainders. At this point, the original argument I reminded you of before, the spectral theorem, can be applied to either this choice or this choice of t times the imaginary unit. And either, for either one, you would get invertibility in L2. It turns out that it is convenient to apply the spectral theorem to this choice of t. And applying to this choice of t, we can now, and, and you know, knowing that this is invertible by the spectral theorem in L2, so then you recover this new equation for the orthogonal projection. But in fact, you don't have just one, you have one equation for every epsilon, a whole family, an epsilon family, of what we came to call uh, localized basic factorizations, because the factorization only applies to the localized kernel. What is the advantage of inverting this operator instead of these weakly smoothing remainders? The advantage is that even though this difference is not compact in LP, it has nonetheless small LP norm depending on epsilon. So one can actually do a direct estimate of the, of the size of the LP norm of this difference and see that it is controlled by this positive power of epsilon for any p.
And so how are you going to win your battle? You're going to fix a Lebesgue exponent p between 1 and 2. And then you're going to choose an epsilon, which depends on p, such that this number is less than 1. What's the advantage of doing this? The advantage is that this operator is now invertible on that for this particular epsilon on that particular LP by a Neumann series argument. And so once you have invertibility in LP for P fixed between 1 and 2, you then observe that this other object, this composition, is in fact bounded on LP. Here you have to use the weakly smoothing properties of the remainders. You have to use the inclusion, the set, in, the, the um, continuous immersions of the LP spaces, depending on the size of P, which come from the fact that you're working with a bounded domain, and the L2 regularity, the natural L2 regularity of the Ziegler projection, to conclude that this composition is bounded on LP. And so you have won your battle because now you have this identity on L2 whose right hand side extends to a bounded operator on LP for a fixed P between 1 and 2 and a certain corresponding epsilon, which tells you that the left hand side also extends to a bounded operator on LP for that particular P. And so you have concluded that the orthogonal projection is bounded on LP for any P between 1 and 2 by making each time for each P a suitable choice of the non-orthogonal projection C epsilon to compare against with. Now, since this operator is self-adjoint with respect to this measure on L2, then by duality, if you know that it is bounded on LP for P between 1 and 2, you know that it's adjoint, that is, itself, is bounded on LP for P greater than 2, and so you have solved, completely solved, the LP regularity problem for this operator on this space. Now, how do you go from a leray levy measure to a leray levy like measure? By an argument which I'm not going to highlight, um, that allows to directly correlate the non-orthogonal projections with the, and their adjoints with respect to the different measures, which lead to the cancellation you needed, not just with respect to the Leray-Levy measure, but with respect to the given Leray-Levy-like measure. And this leads to this result, which goes back to 2017, which says what we, which summarizes everything we have said so far. So for a strongly pseudoconvex domain of class C2 bounded in Cn, and for any Leray-Levy-like measure, the corresponding Cauchy-Zego projection is bounded, extends to a bounded operator on LP with respect to this Leray-Levy-like measure for P in the full range. So let's now change the setting and go to the uh, commutator of the uh, orthogonal projection. So we're just as before working with a strongly pseudoconvex domain of class C2 and a Leray Levy like measure. Instead of studying the orthogonal projection, we now move on to its commutator by some square integrable symbol. The symbol B is a square integrable because why do we chase, choose L2 instead of L1? It's because this operator is naturally bounded on L2. By commutator, we mean precisely this int difference. So the difference between the um, pre, pre and post composition of the orthogonal projection with multiplication by the symbol B. And so now there are two questions we are interested in. Question number one, characterize the boundedness in LP of this commutator Question number two, characterize the compactness in LP of this computator in terms of properties of the symbol B. So let's try to understand qualitatively how, what's the main, what kind of obstacle arises when one is trying to study the commutator of an orthogonal projection as opposed to the orthogonal projection itself. So as we said, Hilbert space theory 
tells us that the orthogonal projection is trivially bounded on L2. On the other hand, the commutator of an orthogonal projection has no projection properties, so even studying its L2 regularity problem requires proof. There's, there's nothing we get for free from Hilbert space theory or, um, yes, exactly, from, from you know, the, the spectral theorem. On the other hand, why did we not ever look at, at the LP compactness problem for this orthogonal projection in the earlier work? Well, that's because orthogonal projections can never be compact on LP. And this is because the cauchy zeigler projection is projecting onto a closed subspace, which is an infinite dimensional subspace of LP. And we know that the identity on an infinite dimensional space can never be compact. So this is just to give you a sense of how different these two problems are in nature. Now, as far as landmark results go, it turns out that these problems of characterizing compactness and boundedness of the commutator by the orthogonal projection were rather classical. In 1976, which by the way is about the same time when, when Kurzmann Stein and Calderon were studying the problems I described below before, Koifman, Rockberg, and Wise were, were able to completely characterize the LP regularity and LP compactness problem for the commutator of the Zego projection on the ball in CN, the uh, unit ball in CN. Question. Yes? Um, so, uh, up until now, we were talking about, uh, if I may say, um, the extension problem of a certain uh, operator. Yes. Of the position operator. Um, so this to me sounds like a, a very well motivated problem. Uh, yes. why, where does the commutator come in? Like, uh, uh, like, is there a motivation in operator theory to look at the commutator uh, and, and somehow not? Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question. You see, at the time, people were studying commutators a lot. And I guess it has to do with the properties of the commutator for the Ritz transforms, because those operators could be used, those commutators could be used to solve certain, I'm thinking of the, I'm thinking of the Diff curl lemma, for example, which Koifman and, and Rockberg were involved in looking into for, for, you know, this classical objects of harmonic analysis. It turns out that if you knew that the commutator is bounded, then you can say something about other properties of the operator. So I would say, and of course, again, I'm just, this is a guess that I'm making. So when it turned out from real harmonic analysis that the study of commutators of classical singular integrals like the Ritz transforms had deep applications to other problems. And so, those same people that were looking into those questions, they said, okay, let's see what can we say about the commutator for the, uh, you know, the orthogonal projection here, the cauchy zeigler projection. I cannot think of any, I'm not aware of a direct application of this, but I can say that based on the context that was coming from other operators at the time, this was a natural question. That's and I'm aware that this might be a non-satisfactory answer. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, you have about five minutes more, if that's okay. You have Was that, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So I'll be I'll be very quick. So there was, you know, there is a history that goes back that gives complete characterization of the problems for the ball. And then several years later, you can see from 1976 to 2001, Kranz and Sung Ying Li were able to extend those results from the ball to any strongly pseudo-convex domain of class C infinity. Now, their proofs were very heavily relying on the fact that domain, the domain has to have smooth boundary. And I will say no more, but I'll just say that their proofs could not be extended to boundaries of class C2. And so, you know, Later, right before the lockdowns, the, the first pandemic lockdowns, I was visiting this two, people, two of the collaborators in Australia. That was my very last business travel before the entire world went on lockdown. We started by looking into these corresponding problems for the commutators of 
this family of Cauchy integrals. And, you know, this was following on the our earlier work of those people. And, you know, we were able to obtain some characterization in one direction. So assuming that the symbol is in BMO or VMO, obtain compactness, the deuce compactness or regularity of the commutator. There were some conceptual problems in going in the opposite direction, which I'm not going to um, elaborate on. So just a word about the proof and I will end here. You see, we had this factorization argument, right? That I was highlighting before for Hilbert space. So one would like to say, okay, can I do that same kind of factorization to the commutators? So here is the commutator of the operator I don't know about. Here is the one of the operator that I do know about. Can I compare them on the Hilbert space? Well, in the basic arguments, you have to work with projections. Neither of these is a projection. And so this means that if you were looking for a basic factorizations along these lines, there would be no chance of being able to obtain it. And so the only thing that you can do and works is to take the basic factorization of the projection, put it in here, unravel, and see what you get. And um, I will stop here. Thank you for your patience, and I apologize for very likely running a little bit over time. Uh, thank the speaker again. No, for the speaker, for this one, speaker. Thank you. Uh, I open the floor to four questions. Hello, Nishan. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, so, yes, I want to ask one question. What happens if C2 is replaced by C1 of the boundary of Omega? Oh, if C2 is replaced by C1, is that yes. the question? Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a terrific question. We don't and I see can... your slides anymore. Maybe you want to point, use your slides again? Or... Uh, yes, I could actually use my slides again. Let me just uh, share my screen again. Go back here. All right, and in fact, I want to go away. Uh, is there a way I can find my pages? So please don't look, I don't wanna give you a headache. All right, I don't wanna give you a headache. <laughs> Sorry, don't look. Uh, let me see, let me find, yes. So yeah. for C1, there is nothing we can say. And I doubt that we are we are we are going to be able to give any answer in the C1 setting. Uh -huh. If we look at the one-dimensional problem that was studied originally by Calderon, also in 1978, the original problem was to study LP regularity of the one-dimensional Cauchy integral associated with a Lipschitz curve. Uh -huh. Right, so instead of a smooth curve, a Lipschitz curve, we are allowing corners, let's say. Yeah. So it turns out that the, this question depends heavily on the regularity of the domain mm -hmm. of the curve. If the curve is of class C1, so the question is essentially trivial if you're working with a smooth curve, C mm -hmm. infinity or C2. Mm -hmm. The threshold is the class C1. If you're working with a curve of class C1, you can still get the answer, solve the problem by approximating your curve with smooth curves. Exactly. So the conceptually new problem is the situation when the curve is Lipschitz. Mm -hmm. Lipschitz means that if you take a parametrization for the curve, then its first derivative will be simply in L infinity and no better, right? right? That's the rather right. accuracy. Now, if you look at this kernel, so think of your row naught as the parameterization of the boundary. Let's just think of it, you know, roughly this way. So you see that you're working with two derivatives okay. of the defining function, which means that if you want to try and replicate um, Calderon's argument, so you would have to be able to have something here, which is Lipschitz. Mm -hmm. Lipschitz means that you're working with a domain that is of class C11. Right. The first derivative has to be a Lipschitz function. Mm -hmm. So I would say at this stage, the most possibly, the, the, more gen, the more gen, most general setting where we might be able to say something 
is for domains of class C11. Hmm. However, for such domains, there is no natural notion of strong pseudoconvexity. There is, however, a natural notion of strong silinear convexity, mm -hmm. which we're not going into because we don't have enough time. So I will say that the closest we can get to the question you are asking is the following. What can we say about the cauchy zegel projection for a strongly silinearly convex domain of class C11? Mm -hmm. This would be the closest to the original question of Calderon. And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> it's a question that I've been thinking about for quite a while. There is no, at the moment, there is no known factorization paradigm that can help us figure out the problem. In particular, in 2014, with Stein, we were able to show that the holomorphic, there is some kind of holomorphic Cauchy integral for this family of domains, which is bounded in LP for P in the full range. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at those Cauchy integrals and you look at the difference with their adjoint, there is no global cancellation, there is no local cancellation, there is no phenomenon that you can use that's going to lead you to some kind of factorization that that you can productively use to study the orthogonal projection so thank you for your excellent question and i hope that in the not too distant future i can give you an answer but definitely not right now okay no just i want to ask since rho naught is in c1 Rho naught is in C1, yeah. yes. Now you uh, regularize it to C2 or C infinity by mm -hmm. epsilon. Rho naught convolution with some uh, modifying sequence. Yeah, the problem is that Can this you over... reduce yeah. to the C infinity situation. Um, so say that again? Uh, no, when you regularize Rho naught by Rho naught epsilon. Yes. Infinity, uh, still keeping the con uh, pseudo convexity. Yes, so with the Ronald epsilon, you can keep the strong pseudoconvexity. Yes. Then you can apply the your theorem because C2 or yes, C2. yes, exactly. Then for a then reason, right? epsilon tends to zero, uh, then of course the measures will not go. Maybe it converges to something. Uh, I think the problem you're going to run into uh -huh. is that once you do your approximation, yeah, depending on your approximation. Yes, yes, yes. But your smooth, strongly mm -hmm. pseudoconvex domains. Okay. The problem is that you're not going to have a good control on the um, constants of strong pseudoconvexity. I completely agree with you. But yes. now you put make an, uh, another assumption on DD bar rho naught. So you want to somehow give, if I understand correctly, you would yeah. like to give some definition of strong pseudoconvexity for a but domain of party one. Exactly. Which could be recovered by an approximation. Exactly. Exactly. So, for instance, so, so this means you're going to say my domain is strongly, my domain of class C1 is strongly pseudoconvex if I can approximate it by a family of smooth, strongly pseudoconvex domains for exactly. which I have control on the constants of strong pseudoconvex. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I think that's something you can do, and I believe that uh, Meiji Shaw, Joachim Michel, and Meiji Shaw oh. gave a definition of strong pseudoconvexity for a Lipschitz domain mm -hmm. in this way, just like you're saying. Okay, okay. And um, I have to tell you, I haven't studied this problem, okay. and it might it might make sense to look into it. Okay, okay. And then, and then to see, you know, to what extent this definition that you're giving uh -huh. compare to the classical definitions, if you're assuming that your domain is in fact smooth. So now so you have they to must coincide. What's that? They must coincide. What's that again? No, they must coincide when, when it is smooth. Ex ex yes, I see. I see. That's a very good question. Okay, okay. Because just yes, I want to know, Harmander he generalized the, the strong pseudoconvexity by the exhausting functions. Yes. So here also, can you do a, something like that? We have not tried it. Okay. So when you say because he's taking so Harmander takes this exhaustion by smooth subdomain. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes. 
Yes, and so this approach in defining a notion of strong pseudo-convexity would use this exhaustion argument. Right, right. Yes. We haven't tried it. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, that's it. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking an interesting question. Are there other questions from the audience? Uh, can uh, I ask a question? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so Ravi and Abhi. Uh, Abhishek, yes. Abhishek, yes. Ravi, go ahead. Ravi. Uh, okay. So what can you say about if domain is a finite type space, not strongly pseudo-convex? <laughs> That's a very good question. Now, our approach, is all based on using this family of measures, which are essentially mutually absolutely continuous with respect to one another. Oh. Now, if you go from strongly pseudoconvex to finite type, mm -hmm. you still have this reference measures that you can work with, this Lere Levy, say, like measures. Mm -hmm. The problem is that these measures are no longer going to be mutually absolutely continuous with respect, for instance, to induced Lebesgue measure. The reason why you have this, the, you have that this in the strongly pseudoconvex case, uh, the reason why you have that your reference measure is uh, like Lere Levy is mutually absolutely continuous with respect to induced Lebesgue is because you, you, you can say no, that each of the two measures is bounded above and below by the other, I mean, densities, right? Each density is bounded above and below by the other density via some constant. And, you know, in one case, it has to do with the fact that you're working with a domain of class C2, which is bounded. In the other direction, it's because you know that your domain is strongly pseudoconvex, and so you have a positive lower bound on the Levy form. True. The domain is finite type, you only have one inequality, you don't have the other, which yeah, okay. means that you can, you may perhaps by these arguments be able to show that the, say, the, the Zego projection or these, or this cauchy van integrals are bounded with respect to the Larry levy measure. But mm -hmm. that result is not going to imply that they're also bounded with respect to the induced Lebesgue measure. For instance, there is a paper by someone in Sweden who studied this Cauchy type integrals for a family of ellipsoids. Uh, you know, model domains is ellipsoids, which turned yeah. out to be non strongly pseudoconvex, but only a finite type. And you could tell the type mm -hmm. by, you know, some. Yeah. Uh, Specific oh, form of yeah. function. And so they were able to show that the Cauchy type integrals are bounded in LP. They also looked at, you know, the case when P is equal to one and they were able to characterize um, H1 properties, but they were not able to obtain corresponding results with respect to this Lere Levy measures, but they were not able to uh, obtain from those results LP regularity with respect to the induced Lebesgue measure. So as was, I was saying earlier on, that in studying this kind of questions, the measure really matters, the choice of measure. In the in classical real harmonic analysis, everything was done or is done with respect to the, to the induced Lebesgue measure. Whereas in several complex variables, the choice of measure may be tailored to the geometry of the domain. And you might be able to find a particular domain tailored measure for which certain phenomenon are true and can be shown and they may not be true or you may not be able to prove results for like you know the the, the induced lebag uh, okay. so i'm Thank expecting you. that for finite type there are results that are true but only for a certain class of domain specific measures i see Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Just one more question, small question. Can I yes. ask? Oh. See, is the Siegel modular domain, which you defined, did not? Yes. Yes. It is an unbounded domain. I'm sorry, it is a? Unbounded domain. Unbounded, yes. Yes, yes. it's an unbounded Whereas domain. Whereas in your, uh, in your uh, assumption, you yes. assume that always D to be a bounded domain, so the cyclic cause, pseudo-convex. Yes. 
Can you yes. extend your result to the unbounded sickly pseudoconvex domain, which is C2? Can I? I'm sorry. Can you extend your result to, to an unbounded? unbounded. Unbounded I think, yes, 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 yes. I think, the only, yes, this is something we have thought about. So oh. you see this model domain here right. is a single graph. Oh. It is a graph, exactly. One, one graph. So I think you can extend it by this uh, osculation argument uh -huh. to a single graph domain. But if you unbounded domain, right? Okay. If you're taking an unbounded domain, which is, uh, you know, what do we mean by unbounded domain, which is a local graph? I don't have a lot of experience here to say mm -hmm. specifically, but the problem with an unbounded um, domain is that, uh, which is not a single graph. I think right. you're going to run into trouble with approxim uh, with with partitions of unity. Right in breaking up the kernel. So I wouldn't know. I would also be interested in looking at seeing an explicit example of an unbounded domain, which is not a single graph. How singular can it be? Okay, okay. <laughs> so if it is a single, a single graph, we can do it. Yes, I think for a single graph, if you're assuming enough regularity so that you know the osculation is good enough, and okay. the error in going from one operator to the one that you want um, is controllable, and you have, you know, the cancellation. You should be able to do it. Okay. 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 okay that's, it. that's it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, are there more questions? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just one second. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Professor Lloyd uh, so I have to leave for a faculty meeting. So, I'll make someone else the host. Uh, All I right. Thank you. Thank you, Nishant. Thank, thank you so God. much. Thanks a lot for Bye. your very amazing talk. Uh, is it okay if I put the talk on YouTube after this? Uh, uh, is it okay if it is uploaded? Sure, on? sure. So, Not a problem. Thank you. I'll make someone the host and I'll uh, have to take leave. Thanks a lot. Bye. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for a nice talk. Thank so you. I have, uh, I have one question. Like uh, these levy measures, do they have yes. some sort of doubling properties associated to them? Yes. Yes, they do. They do. Um, and if you look at my paper with Eli, I think it's the 2014, the one, uh, no, both of them, yeah, both the 2014 for these strongly cylinderly convex domains and uh, the 2017 for the strongly sort of convex domains you will see that they that they are doubling we 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 look into that so the goal is to reduce these operators to some sort of a singular integral operators in this doubling setup so that yes, they are calderon exactly, in exactly. respect to that setting yes, yes. so we that you can the apply the theorem of uh, quietman yes. wise and all these things yes. okay we we use the tier one theory uh tier one theorem theory in its earliest um you know, conception where where you work with a space of homogeneous type and you're yes. assuming that the measure is doubling. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was the question. You're Thank very you. welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. So any other question? So if not, please thank the speaker here. Thank you for many interesting questions. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.